We're living in a time where people are questioning the value of declarations, declarations of independence, declarations of support, declarations of partnership. They seem to no longer hold such significance when we see that these are paralleled by the declarations supporting terror, supporting rape, and again, denying Jewish rights, demonizing Jews, Israel, Judaism, Jewish history. And so we're in a tough time these days, trying to understand how does the past remain relevant when the present is so complex and any declaration that is made almost has no impact because there are so many declarations being spread through wildfire of social media and the mainstream media. Nonetheless, there are significant moments in history that we want to hold on to. And among them was the Balfour Declaration on November 2nd, 1917, when he issued his famous letter proclaiming in the name of His Majesty's government that the Jewish ancestral national dream was supported by one of the most important governments in the world at that time. It was a monumental achievement, and I've been honored each year to be a part of commemorating that day. With a war against Israel and Jewish rights raging everywhere, it is very poignant to share an interview that was conducted last year in the first month of the aftermath of October 7th, slaughter and attack on Israel and Jewish human rights. So I'm pleased to share with you this very special interview that was conducted in partnership with the Friends of Zion Museum. And we look forward to your listening and of course joining us in commemorating history, holding on to truth, and joining our global community as virtual citizens of Israel at israelforever.org. Thank you for listening. My name is Albert Wexler. I'm the director of Jerusalem Prayer Breakfast, and we are here in the Friends of Zion Museum. We want to give answers for our allies. This is a special report, and together with me is Elana Heidemann. Now, Elana, you are a, a, a doctor of Holocaust studies. You did your, your PhD under Elie Wiesel, of all people. It's, it's quite a, an amazing, amazing thing. But you, you are also here today because we want to talk about uh, Balfour Day. 2nd of November is the day of Balfour. Yes. Tell me about it. Well, uh, it was a monumental event in Jewish history when, when Lord uh, Arthur Balfour stood up as a Christian Zionist that he had been raised as, and he proclaimed after many years of efforts that the, uh, the British government would stand behind Jewish rights to the Jewish ancestral homeland. And as this international affirmation spread around the world, it became a real movement in and of itself. So in 1917, it took place, and then it became reaffirmed again and again in international law until finally the state was established in, on May 14, 1948, of course, following the UN vote for the partition of the land uh, November 29th. So November 2nd, 1917 was a massive turning point in history for many, many people, Jewish and non-Jewish alike. Well, this, this really has a, a very long history. Of course, we talk about uh, the Christian Zionists in England yes. in the 19th century. There's like uh, not just Balfour, there were Lord Shaftesbury and, 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 and many, many others who yes. were, who were um, talking about the return of Jews. And I mean, there's a whole, whole movement that took place. But then uh, Arthur Balfour uh, and also this whole uh, uh, situation that led for this cabinet to come together that was pro-Jewish right. and, and, and uh, that they were able to work together with Chaim Weizmann that was quite unique, and I think it also laid the foundation for the League of Nations mandate later. Absolutely, it did. And I think that the, what was unique was not only the conversations they were able to have between themselves reaching a point of consensus that about the Jewish nationalism, which today is considered to be a challenging concept for some people to accept, the idea of a justifiable nationalism, 
but also their ability to recognize the rights of the Jewish, who were the Jews, why was this deserved? And that was something that, yes, predated uh, all the way to the 1800s, even with the start of the political Zionist movement. So Chaim Weizmann was in a really well-positioned time to be meeting with people who had been hearing about this movement from within the Jewish world, and it awakened things in their hearts. Well, because we read the Bible, we know the Bible, we know history. So therefore, this is a legitimate and recognizable pattern of events, the return of the Jewish people to, the, to their eternal homeland. But nowadays, we see that argument twisted on its head in so many ways, they forget the integrity on which the Balfour Declaration was made. Well, definitely, there were, there were many, many motives that yes. the British government had. Of course, uh, but always there's politics. There's the empire, yeah. you know, yeah. and that was, that was something that they had to uh, stand for and, mm -hmm. and, and fight for its interest. And it was uh, uh, good for the empire, uh, especially knowing that there was a, the First World War was about to end, right. and then the, the British forces were actually approaching Beersheba, and that was the right time. But again, to do that uh, on 2nd of November, and to say that His Majesty's government looks favorably on creating a Jewish national home in Palestine was, was a, a major change of history. And uh, I think it's a worthy day to celebrate, don't you think so? It is so? a worthy day to celebrate, and I think there are many ways that people have been trying to do that ever since its centenary. The centenary uh, was a major awakening for people. We uh, launched our Balfour Initiative trying to to uh, interest people in learning more about how even political decisions that might have these other ulterior motives, how are they based upon a foundational argument that favors Jewish rights, Jewish ancestral, and by the way, in the original draft that was not approved of huge debate that was taking place, it had been written until just you know weeks before, state. But then they insisted on changing it to home mm. because we are always facing the need to shape our language for the benefit of the universalist message. So changing it from Jewish state to Jewish home for the sake of the final declaration, it is uh, something that we also need to be aware of. How do we use words today to reflect the rights that were reflected mm. in those statements and those declarations then, and the declarations by other leaders since? You have many declarations in favor of the Jewish rights to the land of Israel, then called Palestine. Again, important to give people the, the words that they need. Jews were Palestinians. Jews were Palestinians. My grandmother is a Palestinian. She <laughs> left in 19, you know, in 1947. And she says, you know, I, she doesn't have an Israeli passport. So she tells people, Palestinian. that's what we have to remember. Yeah. If you called an Arab a Palestinian, they took it as an insult. When it was when the Arab boycotts and the attacks and riots against Jews were taking place, it was Arabs against the Palestinians. So the whole use of language has been usurped. Yeah, whether time. it was home, state land. Uh, right now, the idea of occupation and how it's being abused, even the, you know, even these little tiny words of justice, freedom, they're being abused in a way that has become easy for the universal population to say, wait a second, maybe the Jew is wrong just like has happened again and again in history. Maybe what they're saying about the Jew is correct. Maybe there's something we should be speculating. The bombing of the hospital that just took place, the first reaction was to believe the Hamas report. The lies. And to not believe because it came out of Israel that it wasn't them. We have the same tendencies of anti-Semitic theories going on all around us, and people don't know how to use language right. So why is this related to, the Bal to Balfour Day and why is it related to what we're facing today? Because people need to feel empowered that they're, f they're following a pattern that we've seen again and again in history of people who have stood up and said, wait a second, this nation, this Jewish nation has very specific rights and we are going to stand with them for their humanity and for their historical legacy because that's the destiny of the Jewish nation that we have... We well, have to outlive. Going back so. to, the, uh, to, to Balfour and the Balfour Day that uh, actually yes. uh, we celebrate on uh, November 2nd, um, 
I, I understand that Woodrow Wilson, President Wilson, saw the, uh, the text of the uh, declaration and he approved it. Mm -hmm. So that it, then it was stuck. Uh, they couldn't change it pretty yes. much because they, they had to go forward with the, the formula right. that, that right. was uh, used. Politics um, again. Well, but it's, <laughs> it was uh, also important to remember that, as you mentioned earlier, Balfour was a, a Bible-believing Christian and he, uh, he, he, he felt that this was the right thing to do, yes. as did many other British politicians at that time, although um, it was not necessarily followed by um, the officers that came here and, and, uh, and, and I mean, they were pretty much instigating the, the demonstrations That's against right. the Jews. That's right. So that was the sad part of it, that although you had the support from top down, it, there wasn't necessarily the support from, from, the, from the people that were here to uh, enforce the mandate. Or the court of public opinion. Of course. The streets, the, uh, the schools. They were not being given the proper tools to be able to understand the logic, the reason, and even the hope that existed behind the Balfour Declaration. It's interesting that we see this is also a rhetoric of today. If you don't educate your younger generation or general population as to why things do make sense that these Jews do have these rights, then they are not equipped to stand behind any declaration, whether it is a president or a prime minister or a foreign secretary, uh, as Balfour was. I, I think that it's very difficult to filter some of those massive declarations down to the street without the help of the common people. And what we're doing today is trying to empower the common people to be able to do more with their voice. So you have Friends of Zion and you have Jews around the world who have the opportunity through Israel Forever to become virtual citizens of Israel, to be recognized for their civic responsibility towards Jews as a people and the Jewish rights. Now let, me, let, let us talk about this. I really love yes. the idea. You, you, you mentioned it now, the virtual citizenship. Yes. I love it. Now, let's, uh, let's talk about uh, virtual citizenship. How can our friends uh, look in uh, watching us uh, from Kentucky, of all also, places? Also, yes. And, uh, and, uh, because you're I, from... I'm, I'm originally from Kentucky, and my family is in Maryland, and I lived in Aspen, Colorado, and I uh, was in Boston places. for many years. Yeah. Uh, but we have a home, and uh, unfortunately, we're even seeing more and more people are uh, being, um, you know, uh, forced to recognize even that they thought they could be safe in their home and the diaspora. More and more people are questioning, why is this home far away mm. something that I connect to? Maybe there's somebody who didn't necessarily uh, know what to think about Israel because they hear so much anti-Israel uh, rhetoric circulating. They don't know where they stand, but you know what? We have to realize we have a home, and that home belongs not only in our homeland, but also our home as a nation. So VCI is a way to create Jewish unity and to empower Jews and our non-Jewish friends who are interested in learning and engaging with what it means to stand, not just stand with Israel. It's awesome. Go to the rallies and raise your flags and hang your banners, but how do you live it? But I mean, I like it. I like the idea of virtual citizenship. I mean, I would like to have a passport. I mean, you, I, I mean, I have a passport. Virtual passport. I have that's a real. It. I have a real passport. Of so, course. But I mean, our friends in in Kentucky or in uh, uh, Colorado or where are you? Wherever you are, I mean, becoming virtual citizen of Israel. Israel. That's right. I mean. It's a simple act. Elana, I mean, are you the one signing the, the passports? I am, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and with God's help, we'll be able to get many, many more. We have partner organizations who have joined the movement. Uh, we have uh, a wonderful series of benefits and resources that become taxes. accessible. Are they paying and taxes? No, actually. <laughs> as uh, some of our, we have had some really wonderful people also declare their, themselves virtual citizens of Israel, uh, ranging from Alan Dershowitz's of virtual citizen, and he has been chairman uh, of our community for many years, along with Erwin Kotler. Uh, we, Sheldon Adelson, may he rest in peace, was a proud virtual citizen of Israel. And we have others, uh, you know, Rudy Giuliani, who has just uh, showed interest. So, and 
others who are also citizens of Israel but would like to join the virtual community. So, so how? It really is global. How can our friends who are watching us become virtual citizens? Israelforever.org. 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 Because Israel is forever. Israel is forever and not, not in the confines of how modern day rhetoric is defining Israel by borders, but rather by the Israel that is the legacy and the destiny of the people and the nation and the heritage and everything that has allowed us to sustain these 3,000 years. It, this is the miracle. And we want to be able to give people a sense of belonging, that they're a part of that miracle, however they practice, however they believe, whatever your growing up is. You can find something new that can ignite the pride. That's what this war has done for so many people. It has ignited in them something that is, shall we say, their blue and white blood. We learn of trelet in the Torah, we know it was brought, they had trelet, the blue at Sinai. We know that this color has been with us again and again in every generation. It's on our talitot, it's on the tzitzit, it's the color of our flag, and it's the color of every flag even before we had the state of Israel. It's the color of every youth movement uniform. It's the color of the ceilings in the synagogues in almost every community in the world. And I know in, in your hometown also, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the ceiling is trelet with white stars. It's also in Vilna like this and it's also throughout Poland. And these were used as colors of empowerment and of peace and hope for all of us. So let it be that we, uh, we wear our blue and white, we share our pride, and whether in public, which is not easy for many people today. They do not want to be in public. More and more Jews are being attacked. And as a survivor once said to me, what are we waiting for? For Jews to come home at the end of the day bloody when they come home from school? No, we have to wake up now. We have to wake them up before there's more. And that's why we need to be Israel strong. So on the Balfour Day, the 2nd of November, why not? make a decision to become Israeli, yes. virtual Israeli citizen. And uh, that's the day to, you know, that's show right. your love towards Israel. That's the day to uh, show your identification. You are the one identifying yourself with the people of Israel, state of Israel. And uh, I mean, this, this might be the right thing to do on 2nd that's of right. November. That's I right. think it's a great idea. That's right. Now, um, you, you mentioned earlier something that really touched me. You said that the Jewish people are asking their neighbors, will you hide me? Yes. So a lot of the work that I do is uh, very personal communications with people around the world and uh, discussing what are they facing, what are they feeling, and how are they coping. So while we have lots of emergency campaigns that are aiding the, emergen the needs of those under fire now and our soldiers, sometimes we forget uh, what's really happening out there in our Jewish street. I have uh, been, you know, seeing more and more discussions, uh, people turning to neighbors, would you hide me if the need came? People who have said, okay, here's my house. Should, where would be my best safe room? Ilana, you can tell me, what would I put in my safe room, in my safe space? What kind of alarm would be sufficient? People turning because I'm their, I'm their point person. And we need to be each other's point person to say, wait a second, you know, in the old days, Jews had those networks where you could say, if something happens to me, I'm going to contact this person. And then it's going to get spread. If you, I'm sure you may have seen from, I think it was the, um, the chat from, is it near Oz, where we have the WhatsApp chat of their community. <clears throat> and it's chilly. But you realize that in the diaspora, these, the, the Jewish communities don't necessarily have that. They don't all use WhatsApp. They don't have these groups. Some have started to be built. But if you were in a time of need, what would you do? Who would you call for right away emergency need? We know that there have been Jewish homes that have been broken into. Only a few of them are making them into the news. Broken into in the middle of the night. Uh, Los Angeles, Chicago, we have students in I mean, Tulane. Have, they have broken have... noses. This is going to become worse before it gets better. And we need to be able to address those feelings, their real legitimate feelings that Jews have felt. Leave aside the associations with the Holocaust. Go to the decade, two decades, three decades beforehand, which even gave birth to the, to the Balfour Declaration, by the way. Mm -hmm. They recognized after Kishinev in 1903, yeah. they understood these massacres against Jews are just continuing and we have to find an answer. 
Now, Herzl took it in a political direction, but long before him, the Chovavet Zion, what did they start to do? To create Jewish units of youth who could be trained in self-defense, who could make these networks happen in communities. So the fear is real. It is palpable. People are more and more wanting to hide. They will not raise their flag. That's why the blue and white, wearing our blue and white, can just be a silent message that, that is powerful and empowering for us. That's what we need to do to get through this. Well, the houses were marked also in Paris just yes, recently. I, yes, the uh, door, uh, houses and businesses. And don't forget, we have the mapping project. You've heard of the mapping project? Well, in any case, I believe it is, yeah. it is important uh, for us to, to understand that the realities have changed yes. since October the 7th. And I was just caught myself on this thought yesterday, or day before yesterday, where we took a walk with my wife and was thinking every generation has to be confronted with the Holocaust. I mean, if you don't want it, because I mean, what happened on Sept Sept uh, sorry, okay. October the 7th, that was, I mean, the closest that you could think of. I mean, I know, I, would say it I, was. Know, I know it was, you know, longer and it took, you know, for years and it was different, but at the same time, the, the atrocities, the pain, the yes. humiliation, you know, you had to be reminded yes. of that hatred, of that um, uh, attack, you know, planned. There are people that are planning and they're thinking, as we're talking here, there are people that are planning and thinking how to kill the Jews. That's right, and they're being trained. They are being trained in their secret conclaves, um, underground, different places, and we've seen throughout the news, even for two decades, news reports popping up of this terror, uh, this terror training site was discovered, and this terror training camp was discovered, and we let it go, as if there, you know, there's the story, you know, here's a, a professor says to his students, here's a batch of M&Ms, and everybody takes them, and he says, don't eat them yet, and he says, okay, but let me tell you, one out of every three m and M is poisonous. Would you eat them? And the idea being, we don't want to realize that uh, it's this terror camp and that terror camp, but really it's a message and an ideology that is running through the streets, the death cult and the idea that that death cult is built upon the death of the Jews. The idea that, blood, that the blood of Amalek, it isn't by this n group, this Nazi, these Germans, this uh, only Hamas. It's, it's something that in every generation comes back because we don't know how to quash it entirely. We are very moral and want to live at peace with everyone we live amongst. And so sometimes we say they're not, you know, they're not so bad. We have to let them, we have to distinguish, and we want to, mm. but they don't distinguish. They look at all Jews as the enemy. They look at the existence of any Jewish life as a threat, and that's something similar with the Holocaust, but we have to be careful with the exact parallels. No, you can't. We have to remember sure. that the Holocaust was born out of hundreds of years of pogroms that they weren't just as grotesque as we have seen now, but they were so grotesque, but not systematic. And that's what we're facing. Hmm. Lone wolf attacks will be considered hmm. lone wolf attacks. And, and that's part of the danger is that we don't know how to defend ourselves as a collective if the t attacks are coming mm -hmm. sporadically and, and uh, we can't find one name to call them. Ilana, so so um, we can't just mm -hmm. say Hamas. We have to remember this is an ideology of hate against Jews that was the, the, it gave birth to the political Zionist movement and it gave birth thousands of years earlier well, to me. even Judaism thriving as a society in Jerusalem. Let me, let me point out something that, that I think is, is quite interesting. Um, you mentioned Hovavei Zion, and you mentioned these different initiatives, uh, Pinsker and others who, who did the great work. But you know, when, and this is, this is something that I've been telling our audience of Jerusalem prayer breakfast all over the world, because I think there is something very, very powerful in it. Whenever the Jews and Christians were able to work together, mm -hmm history was made mm -hmm. and, and things were changed. Yes. And so for me, it started with Herzl and Heschler. They worked together. Yes. Despite their differences. Despite their differences. They could right. work together and, and these were very productive years. Yeah. Although their initial plan of creating a German protectorate 
in the Ottoman Turkey didn't work out because of Kaiser's uh, lack of uh, interest. Um, but yet British picked it up and then Chaim Weizmann and Arthur Balfour was the second yes. uh, successful um, you know, example of, of, of Jews and Christians working together. And then, of course, Truman and Eddie Jacobson. Mm -hmm. That's because true. Truman didn't want to hear anything uh, about any Zionist leaders. Because I think they did an overkill. They, they, he, As he, we tend to do. <laughs> if you look at the issues that people say, yeah. we have problems with Hasbara, my belief is that it is that we on the Israeli side do this kind of overkill trying to spread our message, mm -hmm. but our diaspora world they are the ones that have to help us translate that into a language palatable by their communities, whether they're Jewish or Christian. We need those voices to be able to say, it's not Hasbara, it's truth. It's friendship. We, it's, it, but it's friendship that's also based on integrity and a respect Absolutely. for the facts and for the truth. That's why any Christian Zionists throughout history have had their love of Israel based on the Bible. But today we live in a world where people are very, very quick to toss out the Bible as a history book. But you can't. And only those who do are really playing with and, and fanning the fires of hate against Jews and Israel because they don't hate Israel. They hate Israel because it's Jewish. They hate well, Israel yeah. because they hate Jews. But they want to give a politically correct uh, uh, a cushion to it, a picture to it. And they do that very well through propaganda in Pallywood. I mean, they've, Let's see, they've, yeah, succeeded. Pallywood, of course, they've we, succeeded in every way. We, um, we've seen it. But now uh, I want to go back to uh, Eddie Jacobson and Truman. Yes. Because, you know, they were friends. They were friends. And they had a business together, mm -hmm. tailors. And I don't know how much the business succeeded, but the, the friendship succeeded. Yes. Because Eddie Jacobson was the man who had Truman's ear. And he could, he could convince him to meet with Heim Weizmann again. And you know, he had a whole community behind him helping him because he was uh, very active in B'nai B'rith. Okay. And so the B'nai B'rith community really worked with him in order to provide the types of information that, as we're saying, the sensitivities of language. How do you make sure your message is being given to Truman, who stood and, 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 and was on the fence? He stood on the fence like so many people do today. And he was swayed. Was it because of the friendship? Yes, because he was able to Trust. feel in his heart and not just be basing his decision only on political information coming in and being uh, this, th this type of uh, uh, agenda or that, but it was something that he could have trust in the integrity of the messages being given to him. But again, Truman, uh, Truman had his, uh, his Bible, his faith, and he, he, uh, he recognized himself as Cyrus. Yeah, he, he even he said, I am Cyrus. I am Cyrus, that's and, right. Uh, and, and, and yet this, this friendship, I believe, this is the key. And so that's it why is. the virtual citizenship, <laughs> I like it. Yeah. I like it very much because you could, you could become citizen of Israel, virtual citizen of Israel today. And uh, will, will you send the passport? We, uh, we will do our best. Can they print it out? Yes. Wave it? Yes, they can. That would be fantastic. A certificate of recognition that allows you to feel a sense of belonging, a sense of solidarity, and to also join a community of like-minded individuals, not about political minds, but none of the politics, all of the pride, and standing up for what it means for the Jewish people, the eternal nation, to continue to thrive in our homeland, in our state, and forever. And so israelforever.org, today on the Balfour Day, why not become a virtual citizen and, and support Israel and uh, do as uh, the book of uh, Ruth actually says. Uh, you know, you know, this is a, a very famous story how uh, Naomi is telling Ruth, uh, you, you stay, stay with your sister. And she says, no, my God is your God and uh, your God is my God and your people is my people and where you live, I will live and That's right. where you die, I will die. You and, know, uh, when we recognize righteous among the nations who stood up for Jews during the Holocaust, they are less than 2% of the world population, much less. And, uh, and they, uh, they demonstrated a respect for Jewish humanity. 
We have movements for this rights matter and that rights matter, and being a virtual citizen of Israel is a demonstration that Jewish rights matter, and we will all stand together and we welcome all faiths to join us as uh, what we consider to be righteous among the nations who want to stand with Israel, not only in Israel's time of need, but always. The voices of our friends of Israel are so important in fighting anti-Semitism today. It is up to you to find the right resources, the tools, the sentences, not only on the political situation, but why Jews deserve to be respected in a different way, why Israel deserves to be respected, not why does Israel have a right to defend itself. It's an unnecessary, we have a right to defend ourselves. But why the Jew is worthy of being recognized for the legitimacy of their identity, their faith, their history, and their connection to the land, then we might see that there are fewer people who are willing to believe the lies. And those lies are spreading today's anti-Semitism and making the next Holocaust possible. Well, we all can do something about it. We can find a way to use ourselves, our communities, our families, our children, to teach them better as virtual citizens of Israel, as friends of Zion, and as, as human beings everywhere in the world. And so, indeed, your prayers and your help and support is so needed today. As Israel is at war, we need your prayers. And remember, God told Abraham, you will be the father of many nations. And then he had nations in his mind. When he called Abraham, he said, many nations of the world. Actually, he said, all the families of the earth shall be blessed through you. So those you, of you who, who pray for the peace of Jerusalem, remember, may they prosper, who love you, love Jerusalem. So from the Friends of Zion Museum, we want to declare a blessing over you. Shalom from Jerusalem. And tune in the next day, 1 o'clock, in uh, Jerusalem time, Israel time, and uh, see you again. Shalom from Jerusalem.